Very good evening to you. Thank you for staying with us. This is the big story where we break the big stories for you and make sure you get to understand every bit of it. So tonight we'll be doing that with Steve Ogula, who's in studio with us. We'll also be speaking to Irungu Kangata. But uh, for purposes of this conversation tonight, we are speaking to him, seeking his legal mind as a lawyer, but also remember he's the deputy whip in the Senate. Um, gentlemen, thank you so much and uh, thank you for creating time for us on the big story this evening. So it's important to also mention tonight that DCJ Philomena Mwilo did not take a plea um, today. Senior Counsel James Orengo opposed her taking the plea on grounds that the charge sheet was defective and the reasons for her arrest to wanting. He argued that the charges were criminalizing a purely commercial transaction. Steve, let me begin with you. Um, the fact that Philomena Mwilo did not take a plea, what does this really mean legally for her? Uh, thank you, Linda. What it means is that the DCJ remains a suspect and not an accused person. A suspect means in law that the ODPP, the Director of Public Prosecution, has an opportunity to review his prosecutorial judgment and determine whether he really wants to proceed with those charges as were framed or whether he wants to pursue other halfway measures before resorting to the more drastic decision to drag a serving DCJ into a criminal court. So effectively, yes, she's able to resume her duties because she's merely a suspect and not an accused person. And as a suspect or as an arrested person, it is possible that the prosecution reviewing the file before them and the prosecution and the prosecutorial judgment or decision could ultimately alter the format in which they approach this matter. And if they decide to pursue other halfway measures, as I've said, that would include transferring this file to the JSC for review and consideration with a view of determining whether to call her for further clarification and to recommend whether there is need to establish a tribunal or not. And if a tribunal is established and she's then effectively suspended, then the prosecution could make a decision whether to continue with the charges or not. If the, uh, the tribunal is of the view, if the JSC is of the view that the matters raised, as I've seen uh, uh, my, my learned colleague uh, Sifuna said, that these are purely commercial matters, then the, then, the, then the DPP may reflect on that as well and reach a determination that effectively does not undermine his mandate but drives us, uh, uh, that drives us towards the preservation of the legal order. Because remember, Linda, mm. the critical balance that the DPP uh, faces is to preserve the functional arrangement of power. If you are charging a serving DCJ, nobody is saying that you can interfere with the functional or decisional independence of the DPP, no. But we are saying that if the Constitution, Linda, is to be understood as that law that seeks to define, distribute, and constrain the use of state power, then it means that at the level of constraining, the DPP must apply some level of restraint, discretion, and, 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 and good judgment in determining how to handle a file involving a serving DCJ. Mm. And before you reach that extreme decision of dragging the DCJ in court, you may have reflected on possible halfway measures as I've, as I've already outlined. Okay. Um, I'll, I'll get to the whole process and the fact that the DPP actually did mention yesterday that he got the chance um, to meet Chief Justice David Maraga. Explain to our viewers what then would have happened um, speculatively if she had taken a plea. Had she taken the plea, then of course that would heighten the questions around her integrity because if you look at Article 166 of the Constitution, the requirements for appointment of the DCJ includes sound judgment, good character, temperament, and impartiality. Now, all this will be brought into sharp focus if the prosecution assessing the evidence on record, believing that this evidence is beyond what lawyers consider a mere prima facie evidence, because you need a higher threshold when you're making the decision to prefer charges against a serving DCJ, then the fact that she has taken plea of not guilty, still raises the suspicion and heightens the tension around questions around her integrity, and then it is possible that a public-spirited Kenyan may petition the JSC, or the JSC in, on its own motion may then initiate a review of these proceedings with a view of determining whether these proceedings now reveal a reason 
to initiate the, or maybe recommend the establishment of a tribunal. Okay. But as it is now, because she has not taken plea, it means that she remains a suspect, she remains, uh, she remains an arrested person, and that has no legal consequences on her ability to discharge her functions as the DCJ. Great. Thank you, Steve. Let me bring in Mweshimiwa Irungo Kangata into this conversation. Mweshimiwa, first of all, I'd like to get your quick reaction on the fact that we now have uh, this case facing the DCJ. Uh, this is huge. This has not happened in Kenya's history. I'm seeking for your immediate reaction on this. Well, uh, the objections from the lawyers and also what I've heard my two colleagues speak against uh, charging DCJ, to me they are sickening, they are very disheartening, uh, they are very fallacious because they are giving an implication that this Kenya, we have two sets of law, for the rich, for the poor and for the poor. And to me, I think today is a celebration as to why Kenyans rejected the party that is called NASA. Surely, how can you all troop to go and defend one person? And the kind of submissions you are giving to the court is that that person should be treated in a preferential manner just because that person is a deputy chief justice. Today, Kalonzo Musioka, he has lost face. Orengo, he has lost face. The party that is called NASA, they have lost face. Because surely, how many people have been taken to come in this country? You have so many poor people currently facing courts of law. We have even other people uh, in other major positions of power who are currently facing legal proceedings. When you go to other civilized jurisdictions, including places like South Korea, a whole president was hauled out of office. She's currently serving time in prisons. So now we come here in Kenya, you start telling Kenyans, no, this person is, so, is, is, a, is, is a very powerful person. This person should not be charged on the basis of the office that person occupies. That is sickening. I want to make reference to Article 27 of the Constitution, which is very clear. It provides that we are all equal before the law. And therefore, any innuendo, any implication that DCJ is protected against prosecution on the basis of the position she holds, to me, is something that is going to make Kenyans feel very disheartened. I would urge the DPP to proceed and do one thing. According to Article 1, 35 of the Constitution, Article 35 of the Constitution, Kenyans have the right to information. DPP should proceed to release in public realm that evidence and there is every likelihood that evidence that he is holding against DCJ may be quite cogent. And we will be able to know what grounds forms the decision of the DPP to charge the DCJ. All right. Um, I listened into some of the um, presentations in court today, and some of the judges are not allude. Some of the lawyers are not alluding to the fact that. Um, they wanted preferential tra uh, treatment for the DCJ. The issue was there is a procedure on prosecution of judges, which I'm sure you're aware of. From where you sit, is there a different way in, this, in which this could have been carried out? No, for obvious reason. Because number one, that would have be the basis of the defense of DCJ once the prosecution commences. And to me, that nomination, his lawyers, her lawyers would have awaited the case to proceed, and then you start poking holes. You say, no, uh, this case does not reach a certain threshold. It's not a criminal matter. It's a civil matter or it's a disciplinary matter. But now, to proceed and to pay the prosecution on the basis of such allegations to me is unfair. But most importantly, and, and I want to highlight that, uh. vast majority of the lawyers who are giving submissions before the court today were alluding to the fact that she holds a huge office in this country. And in fact, that is what I have heard my friend there, Ogola, commenting. That is what I have heard my other friend who is the ODM, I don't know, Secretary General, alluding that because she is such a big person in this country, she ought to be treated in a differential manner. Hmm. To me, that is so bad. If you are to allow such kind of a philosophy to embed in Kenya, we shall be setting a bad precedence. We shall be telling Kenyans, no, we have two sets of laws, one for the powerful 
and one for the powerless. We shall be saying, no, it is okay for the big fish to be treated in a differential manner. That is not the kind of Kenyan we want. And today, by the way, I'm celebrating the decision why Kenyans never voted for the coalition that is called NASA. It is a party that promotes the interests of the powerful. Okay. I wish I've ever seen Kalonzo Musioka in court going to court to defend the poor people of Sikulu. I have never seen him even a single day. I wish I've ever seen Kalonzo Musioka appearing in court going to defend the poor people of Kitui. I've never seen him in court. But going to court and start giving submissions which allude preferential treatment of one person that is unfair. All right. The um, th country. This would be a perfect point to bring in the sentiments of John Haminwa because then that will clear um, a little bit of what they had to say in court today. And in his words, he said this whole thing is messy. So let's listen to part of what uh, Senior Counsel John Haminwa had to say today in court. The case has to be made up for misconduct. And if he's found she is found guilty or is found guilty, then ceases to be a judicial officer. And at that time, if the state wants to charge him with a criminal offense, can do so. Here we have Deputy Chief Justice, who is still enjoying the trappings of power. He is still the Deputy Chief Justice of the Republic of Kenya. She is entitled to her salary. She's entitled to police protection. She's entitled even to continue to sit as a Supreme, a Supreme Court judge. The whole thing is done in a very, very messy manner. That is not what the law is. And I would invite respectfully those who are dealing with the criminal law of the country. Let them go back. Let them sit down and read the constitutional provisions of the case. Your Honor, may I emphasize before I sit down, with the tremendous respect, you have no jurisdiction to take plea from this lady at all. She is still the Chief Justice of Kenya. Let's keep Justice Kenya. She is still sitting on Judicial Service Commission. Which has supervisory powers over it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying it's a bad manner. Don't mention it. Don't mention it. Don't mention it at all. Yes. But, Your Honor, at the bar and in our judicial system, we go by hierarchy. <laughs> I am a mere advocate. Nothing more than that at all. I'm expected to pay my respects to you as a magistrate. And you are a magistrate. You are expected to pay respect to a high court judge, or judge of court of appeal, or judge of Supreme Court. You have been put in a very embarrassing position. I will not like to be in your position at all. <laughs> <laughs> Steve Ogola, do you process preferential treatment or do you process? I think, Linda, it's important to clarify a few things because, you see, the politicization of this criminal trial is itself one of the unintended consequences that we cautioned about because you can see Mwishimiwa Irungu Kungata is already alluding, playing politics with the criminal trial process, alluding to what NASA says. Listen, I wear strictly constitutional lenses. And I want to state as follows, and the public must be informed, there is and there cannot be an attempt to limit or interfere with the decisional independence of the DPP, but the Constitution has inbuilt control mechanisms that requires him to apply his mind taking into the legitimate need to perform his functions as by the law ordained, while also recognizing the need to preserve the constitutional legal order. Now, it would be naive, Linda, if you allow, 
to think that the manner in which you approach the trial process of a serving DCJ can be the same in terms of decision making as like that of an ordinary citizen. Because of this is a holder of a critical office. Now, nobody is saying that you interfere or you offer preferential treatment, but we are saying that because of the unintended consequences, one of which now which is already highlighting the politicization of the judicial process, necessarily requires that in terms of making sound prosecutorial judgment, can you explain the, the halfway measures that you can take before you reach the level of dragging someone of the caliber of the DCJ in court? Because number one, the position of the Deputy Chief Justice is a very sensitive position. It will occasion serious or maybe irre uh, irreparable reputational injury that will effectively mean that her ability to continue serving in that position as DCJ may be rendered impossible. You must take that into account, which means that as you balance that need to preserve her integrity, because you are assessing the evidence, you need to be nearly certain that the case that you're presenting in court will almost certainly succeed at the court. Number two, you must take into account the unintended aspersion that may be cast on the entire judiciary. Because it would be naive to expect Kenyans to believe that a single judicial officer in the person of the deputy chief justice may, in her own, may be the bad apple in the entire basket that involves the judiciary. The question that will emerge, is the DPP still concerned with perusing or maybe the records or interrogating the personal and professional engagement of all judicial officers and unearthing what may look like criminal evidence for purposes of, pre of, for purposes of preferring charges. Uh -huh. What does it mean in terms of preservation of judicial independence, preservation of perception that the entire judiciary is not amenable or is not open to corrupt practices? That unintended consequence on the integrity of the, of the judiciary must be taken into account. The third issue that the ODPP ought to have taken into account, are there measures that could legitimately address this concern? For instance, assessing the evidence that we have, we have the plea bargaining rules 2018, this evidence could be presented to JSC. JSC could interrogate alongside recommending the, formulation, the establishment of a tribunal, present this evidence to the, DCJ, to the DCJ and negotiate a halfway settlement where she goes to court not to expose herself to a serious legal criminal uh, battle, but to plea bargain and say, I plead guilty based on the evidence available. I apologize. I commit to, ref to, to return mm. whatever it is that I have stolen, if at all. And I then I, I take a sentence that is negotiated without subjecting, us to, without subjecting her to the rigors of a criminal trial process. Because the process of a criminal trial, uh, Linda, if you allow, uh -huh. the process of interrogation Adducing evidence is a, is a process that will expose the entire judiciary, not just the DCJ, into ridicule. So okay. all these factors must have been considered be by the time you reach the decision to prefer charges. Then surely you must be certain that the evidence that you have and considering all other options, this is the best route to take. Can okay. we say with certainty and evidence, Steve? Linda, that this is the best decision in these circumstances that looking at all other circumstances, the DPP could not have arrived at a better decision. That okay, is the question. Steve, Steve, and that I need does to not interject. amount at interference with the decisional independence of the DPP. I need to interject. Um, you have mentioned that probably this uh, should have gone through the JSC. We've listened into Sophia as well. And we all know that the JSC is uh, crippled in terms of quorum. So maybe that is one of the issues that was uh, focused on. But then, Mushimiwa, um, let me get your sentiments on what Stephen has to say. Are we politicizing the war on corruption? No, we are not. Eh? You know, there are so many people who lean on the Jubilee side who have been taken to court. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, number two, the integrity, uh, the integrity of a mama boga or even a youth man who is always being arrested by the police is of equal importance to the integrity of a governor and the integrity of a judge. There's no difference. Number two, we have seen several members of parliament being taken to court, including elected governors. And remember, Governors are people who have been elected. They thrive on what we call their reputation. Their reputation 
Ka is so fragile that once you are in a certain governor before a court of law, they can easily lose an election. But vis-a-vis -vis, this is a judge, you're only being taken to court. Eh, meaning once you're taken to court, you can still proceed with your duties. Eh, your reputation, per se, you have to await conviction. So meaning, eh, in fact, and to me that's the saddest part, what was happening today was just being taken to court. You take a plea. But on the other hand, we must ensure and uphold the principle that all Kenyans are equal before the law. We do not have two sets of law which apply to Kenyans, where you have a situation where because you hold a certain position, you are shielded from criminal prosecution. And that is why people are saying this is quite unfair. You find a person who holds a certain office, the kind of submissions which are being made in court is that that person should be treated in a preferential manner. What about the poor person? What kind of message are you sending to the poor person? That because you, you assume you don't have integrity or you don't have a reputation, you can be taken to court and then your case is hard and determined within a week and you are thrown to jail. You cannot be able to attract Orengo. You cannot be able to attract Kalonzo Musioka. You cannot be able to attract Camino. That is why when they take you before a judge, no one comes to your rescue. Is that the kind of Kenya we should be building? Is that the, the kind of Kenya, the constitution envisaged, where we are not equal before the law? There are so many members of parliament before court of law currently. There are so many governors. People have been elected by the Wananchi. People who have a direct mandate of the people currently. And no one is raising a focus. Mm. So, but once you go to certain sectors, now you start seeing people saying, oh, no, those people should be treated in a preferential manner. Tell me, what you are from... just await the normal motions of the court of law. Mashima, tell me from where you sit, um, and you said there should be no preferential treatment um, irrespective of who someone is in the society. Do you think then that this would be a perfect opportunity and indeed time for the Judicial Service Commission to probably give a statement on this and in a way to reinforce the perception of political neutrality? Yes, to a certain extent, I think uh, Judicial Service Commission needs to pronounce itself a uh, failure to which, in my own opinion, uh, there will be a perception that uh, uh, some people are being treated in a differential manner. And that may negate the whole fight against corruption. I think DPP has done a good decision because it's just carrying out its duties. Uh, but on the other hand, when we have a situation where some people appear to be getting some preferential treatment, those will be negative signals that are going to be sent out to the public and also to the entire legal process. And in a sense, by the way, it is going to justify the decision of parliament to withhold a supporting judiciary. I think, in my own opinion, if you have an institution which is now treating Kenyans as if we have first-class citizens of, of, of Kenya and second-class citizens of this country, to me, that's an institution that is not going to be sending positive message out there. To me, I would prefer an institution that used to be manifested by Mutunga. You recall Mutunga, whenever you'd be called upon to question, Mutunga did not care whether you are rich or you are poor. You'll be called upon to take into account. You'll be told, no, you account for this. But now, this kind of philosophy that is now starting to ooze out of judiciary or some so-called prominent lawyers, they are now selling it out to the public or even the so-called NASA coalition that you should treat some people in a preferential manner. To me, okay. this is very wrong, it's unfair, and I'm very happy the decision why Kenyans rejected a person like Alonso Musioka to become a, a deputy president of this country. Okay, Mushimua, you're moving away from the topic of the debate. It would be important to also listen into what uh, Chief Justice David Maraga had to say when he was asked about this particular uh, case facing his deputy. Could you listen into that? Then I get the final sentiments. She has been discharging those responsibilities since she came to the office. Okay. Yeah, she has. Those are. Uh, she, she, she's uh, the person who has uh, been performing the position of uh, the, 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 the judiciary ombudsperson. Okay. Yeah. And Leave it at that, that. I don't want to comment on matters that are in court. No, no, no. Right. So 
Mwishimiwa, let me get the final word from you. This is a sitting Deputy Chief Justice, she has security of tenure, listening into Maraga. Give me your final sentiments. Well, uh, one, we are not saying that uh, DCJ is guilty. No, 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 we are not saying that. We don't even have any evidence that has been furnished to the public. Uh, it's a matter that is still in court. No one is alluding to that. The only objection that we are raising is that we should allow every Kenyan citizen to be treated in an equal manner. That is the whole idea. We should not have two sets of laws or we treat some people as if they are first class citizens of Kenya and others as second class citizens of Kenya. That is yep. the bottom line. All right, all right. Thank you. Steve Ogola, 30 to seconds. Some of the sentiments that are coming from our country. Steve, 30 seconds. Um, the inescapable conclusion is that the decision to prefer charges against a serving DCJ when there exist several halfway measures of dealing with the problem before arriving at that ultimate decision to prefer charges will in the end prove to be a very stern test mm. on the decisional independence okay. and the sound prosecutorial judgment on the part of the DPP. Okay. I need you to may wrap pontificate it up. forever. Steve, I need to wrap this up. Thank I you. absolutely need to wrap this up. But thank you so much for your time. Steve Ogola, who's a lawyer, and Irungo Kingata, who's the deputy chief whip in the Senate, um, but also a legal mind. And of course, a very big thank you to our Sophia Wanuna, our lead reporter on The Big Story. That's where we leave it. Have a good evening. Akisa Wandera is up next with Katie and Prime.